Section 12 of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aubrey Kirkham. Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Joan of Arc part one monarch of france send thou the tidings over all the realm great tidings of deliverance and of joy the maid is come the missioned maid whose hand shall in the consecrated walls of reims crown thee anointed king southeys joan of arc in this age of intelligence and refinement of the arts of commerce political science and christianity it is difficult to believe that so few years comparatively have elapsed since superstition threw her dark pall over all that is now bright and attractive the period is not very remote when the most trivial events were presumed to be of an unearthly or supernatural character when it was rare indeed that any man however much in advance of his age and knowledge had the boldness to attribute an unforeseen and extraordinary occurrence though susceptible of the fullest explanation to its proper and legitimate cause among the polytheists of greece and rome to doubt the interposition of these numerous divinities in the commonest concerns of life was the worst grade of treason to the state they believed as they were taught by the religion in which they placed their trust and by its priests whom they reverenced that every waterfall had its nymph, every grove its dryad, that there was a deity to smile upon every folly, to encourage every unholy passion, or to strengthen every virtuous hope and noble aspiration. In the dim religious light of a later era, popular credulity clung with less tenacity to the forms and ceremonies than to the substance of superstition astrology was mistaken for astronomy philosophy and magic were synonymous terms palmistry and necromancy were ranked among the sciences the belief in ghosts and witches was general ancient wood and castle were peopled with spirits and hobgoblins bright-eyed elves beset the path of the lonely wayfarer and light-footed fairies danced the livelong night upon the green the French historian, speaking of this period, says, Henceforward, Diablerie had little to learn, but was soon erected into a science. Demonology brought forth witchcraft. It was not sufficient to be able to distinguish and classify legions of devils, to know their names, professions, and dispositions. It was necessary to learn how to make them subservient to the uses of man. Hitherto the subject studied had been the means of driving them away. From this time, the means of making them appear was the end desired. Witches, sorcerers, demonologists started up beyond all number. Each clan in Scotland, each great family in France and Germany, almost each individual, had one of these tempters, who heard all the secret wishes one feared to address to God, and the thoughts which shunned the ear. They were everywhere. Their flight of bats almost darkened God's own light and day. They had been sent to carry off in open day a man who had just received the communion, and who was watched by a circle of friends with lighted tapers. Such was the character of the age, made up of credulity and superstition, prone to believe and trust in the strange and the marvelous, ready to grasp supernatural aid when human efforts failed. Such was France when, at the death of her maniac king, Charles the Sixth, a bloody struggle for the crown commenced between the various competitors and their adherents, a struggle prolonged from a want of skillful military leaders, and the superstitious belief of all parties in omens preceding a conflict which depressed them with cowardly fear, or elated them with reckless courage, according to the import of the signs. Chance decided the victory. The rival houses of Orleans and Burgundy were the instigators of the civil war that desolated France, enlisting the aid of foreigners who threatened to subjugate the nation to British power. 
Charles the Dauphin, sixth son of the deceased monarch, and claimant of the crown, strengthened the Orleans party by marrying a daughter of Count Armagnac, a Gascon nobleman of influence in his rude land, warlike, fierce, and not unfitted to lead a party in those days of open strife. On the other hand, the young Duke of Burgundy, in revenge for the murder of his father, in which Charles had participated, offered the crown of France to Henry V of England, already upon their shores with a well-disciplined army, in answer to the call of the old duke. In accepting the tendered throne, he espoused Catherine, the daughter of Charles the Sixth. but before his young head bore the weight of a double crown, he died, leaving an infant son, Henry the Sixth, with the Duke of Bedford at Paris, to rival the claims of the little king of Bourges as Charles was called in derision by his enemies. And indeed this raillery was not amiss, for the Dauphin surely straitened in his resources, being scarcely able to furnish his table. He was naturally amiable and weak in character, yet adversity lent him courage and prudence that served him in time of need, but relaxed into effeminate ease when his foes granted him tranquillity. His army was made up of the sturdy Scotch retainers of the Earl of Bouchant, soldiers from Italy and Spain, the fierce, cruel Armagnacs, and such of the France as supported his claims, though he placed little dependence on the unskilled troops of his own nation. France was thus overrun with a foreign soldiery, who made up for their lack of enthusiasm in the cause which they supported by the hearty eagerness with which they pillaged the towns, cities, and hamlets that fell into their hands. There was scarce a river in France but had rolled a crimson tide through its channel, or borne the mangled corpse of friend and foe to low, quiet valleys, terrifying the simple inhabitants and warning them that strife and bloodshed were near. Neither age nor sex were spared the inhuman butchery. Scarce an humble cottage but had wrongs to revenge, and not a palace or castle had escaped the mournful loss of some of the noblest blood of France as often spent in petty vengeance as on the field of battle. The English, supported by the Burgundian party, succeeded in capturing every town north of the Seine, driving Charles and his adherents beyond the Loire. Had the English now unitedly pushed their conquests, France would have been completely subjugated. Their strength was destroyed, however, by private feuds and jealousies which finally obliged the Duke of Bedford to return to England leaving Charles the Seventh in a comparative state of tranquillity. Orleans was the last stronghold left him, and in that city and in the surrounding region his remaining followers stationed themselves. The king, so far from making defensive preparations and accumulating forces in the two years' interval of peace, spent the time in distant chateaux, luxuriating in ease and pleasure, utterly regardless of the petty intrigues and struggles for power that daily weakened his party. But all these years of turmoil and war and superstition were schooling a daring spirit to uphold the victorious batterers of France, not a noble youth learning the tactics of war at the side of a chieftain father, not a young tell gathering vigor in the strong mountain air and practicing eye and hand to unerring archery, nor a bold genius whose military talent was to place him at the head of the armies of France, but a simple, gentle, peasant girl instigated by imaginary saints and angels. Jeanne of Arc, or Jeanne d'Arc, la Pousseur d'Orléans, according to the old chroniclers, was born in the department of Vosges, in northern France, in the year 1411 or 1412. Her family name is said to have been written Dark. She was the third daughter of an honest and worthy husbandman, bearing the name of Jacques d'Arc, who, though a native of Montier-Udir at the time of her birth, dwelt in the pretty little village of Domremy, which lies in one of the most beautiful valleys of the winding Meuse, between the towns of Neuchefetiaux and Vacoyers, and on the borders of Lorraine and Champagne. In this lovely and fruitful region she first saw the light. Her quiet and pleasant home, the rich pasture-lands that girt it as with a belt of emeralds, the neighboring groves of beech and chestnut, where fairy forms were seen to flit and fairy voices whispered, the balloon-shaped hills of the Vosges, 
which stretched far away to the land of the vine and the olive and the dark forests of oak and fir that crowned their summits shaking and bowing their stately tops in the fragrant breezes from the purple vineyards and the smiling slopes of burgundy these were all the world to her through the quiet and peculiarly meditative years of her childhood the sweet-toned bells in the chapel of our lady of belmont lulled her infant slumbers with their musical chimes and as she grew older her young mind expanded in an atmosphere of legends and myths of saints and fairies that gave a wild and boundless range to a naturally vivid imagination her mother in whom a superstitious piety was strongly implanted kept the little ones quiet while she plied the humming distaff by telling them tales of valiant knights and fair ladies carried off by demons or visited by angels and attended by a troop of fairies all which the young listeners most devoutly believed the young joan never lost a word of the wonderful legends storing them in her memory till her brain became peopled with imaginary beings who accompanied all her lonely rambles whose voices whispered to her in the stirring leaves of the forests whose forms were wreathed in the mists of waterfalls and whose tones were as audible to her sensitive ear in the gushing music of winding streams as they had been in the sweet tones of her mother's voice when united with the dreary hum of the spinning wheel she never danced and sung like the other maidens in the hamlet nor joined in their merry sports but preferred to steal away by herself and tell over beads to kneel in a shaded aisle of the chapel and to breathe her baptismal vows at the sacred shrine or at the hour of vespers devoutly repeat the compline before a favorite picture of the virgin but if she did not mingle with gay playmates at the sound of the viol she could boast of a neat and nimble use of the needle and could ply the distaff with speed equal to her mother's reading and writing were unsolved riddles to her for these were accomplishments known only to the clergy to those of gentle birth or to such as depended on them for a livelihood and there were many a peerless dame and gallant knight who deemed these performances as unbecoming labor and kept servants in the household to do such menial offices it is asserted by some that joan was a servant in a roadside inn and tended the horses and the guests in the capacity of an hostler and that she rode them to the watering places thus acquiring great skill in horsemanship these facts are not well authenticated however and they certainly are not in keeping with the gentleness modesty and delicacy of her character it is related by others that she tended her father's flocks and herds while they grazed on the mountain side a not improbable occupation and a very common one in the valley of the meuse here upon the slopes gorse flower glowing as the sun illumed their golden glory she rested the livelong day watching grazing herds and, and looking down upon the picturesque valley bordered with a vast forest its green meadows luxuriant vineyards the river with its wooded banks and her own loved hamlet in the midst invoking good spirits to guard it against the ravages of war nor let the clash and din of weapons echo among the blue hills that shut in the peaceful valley but the occasional traveller brought tidings of unjust and murderous deeds and as joan's spirit began to break away from the enfoldings of childhood her lonely day watches were occupied with burning thoughts of her country's wrongs she longed to pass beyond the hills where she was born and mingle in the mortal strife her pale cheek crimsoned when she heard the story of helpless women falling beneath the battle-axe and children driven forth to suffer the horrors of famine that their cries might intimidate the stout hearts of their fathers and make them yield their strongholds and when at last a troop of fierce soldiers came with victorious shouts along the muse to the very heart of the sacred valley and joan and the humble household had to flee for safety then the martial spirit pervaded her being and was henceforth inseparable from the religious fervor that actuated her in freeing france from her enemies the fugitives returned to the unobtrusive village and found the beloved chapel in ruins this wanton destruction of her favorite and holy resort awakened a new feeling of heroism in joan which with unfixed purpose only awaited events which should direct her in the vicinity of domremy was a large old tree whose immense thick foliage branches overspread a wide green sward it had stood through many generations 
and legend upon legend hollowed its remembrances to the young people it was known as the tree of the ladies and beauty of may and tradition said the fairies used to meet and converse with brave knights who in later times had become so wicked that the sprites refused to appear to any but the good and virtuous at early dawn the maidens of Dolremi tripped the footprints of the fairies where they had danced all night beneath the giant tree and they hung garlands upon the branches wishing they might get a glimpse of the forms that joan assured them she had seen and whose voices whispered mysterious things to her near by was also a fountain called the fountain of the fairies and here the young girl lingered for hours till she saw the misty waters take shape and beheld the holy features of saint margaret or saint catherine beaming kindly upon her and she heard them in a low soft voice call her the restorer of france and felt them affectionately embracing her this she related to her parents and the village maidens but it only excited their derision since none of them were equally fortunate she solemnly chided them for their unbelief for she evidently had faith in these visions the result of a morbid imagination dwelling constantly upon one theme after the intelligence of the marvellous success of the english and the retreat of charles the seventh beyond the loire she had startled the quiet laborers in the valley and become the theme at every cottage door or fireside joan's visions became more vivid and in her daily visits to the fountain she discovered the mission which the angels had devolved upon her saint michael the archangel of battles and of judgments appeared in the midst of a dazzling light saying jeanne go to the succor of the king of france and thou shalt restore his kingdom to him saint marguerite and saint catherine will be thy aids a host of angels in white wearing crowns and speaking in soft voices followed the appearance of saint michael and when they had all disappeared the timid girl wept abundantly wishing they had taken her with them several years had passed in this way confirming joan's belief in these messages and commands from god as she denominated them she obeyed the voices which directed her to attend church faithfully and perform all her duties she was known to all the villagers in her pious and charitable acts and her youthful friend Homet assured her companions that joan was a good simple girl and always talked of god and the angels she entered maidenhood pure and beautiful the impress of her unsullied thoughts stamped upon her pale calm face full of childish innocence yes adorning a mind of rare sense and shrewdness both her mother and father reproved her firm belief in the mission that had been given her and with alarm found her already practising military exercises mounted upon a horse and tilting her lance against trees as if in knightly combat her father declared that rather than see his daughter among men-at-arms he would drown her with his own hands hoping to divert her from her wild unwomanly schemes her parents used their authority to secure her marriage a young man declared she had promised him her hand in childhood and to enforce his claims cited her before the ecclesiastical judge of Toul. this they thought would frighten her into acceptance since with her timidity and modesty that suffused her face with blushes at a word from a stranger she could never summon courage to defend herself to her surprise she appeared in court and declared the falsity of the charge a visit from an uncle at length secured an opportunity for her to execute her purpose he was convinced of her divine mission and promised to take her to robert de baudricourt captain of vacouilleurs to whom saint michael had directed her for aid bidding farewell to her beloved home her cherished mother and dear companion omette she journeyed with her uncle to vacouilleurs in her simple peasant's costume a coarse red dress and little close white cap they travelled nearly four leagues among the banks of the meuse and traversed the valley spread with verdant meadows enamelled with flowers from which the town derived its name and at the extremity of which it lay in the form of an amphitheatre they arrived in the busy streets where all was new stirring life to the young girl who had never before wandered beyond the hills that encircled her home they sought the dwelling of an hospitable wheelwright whose wife was captivated with the gentleness and beauty of the strangely commissioned maiden joan's uncle had previously obtained an interview with baudricourt giving an account of her and asking the aid she desired to which the blunt soldier replied give her a good whipping and take her back to her father 
nothing daunted by this scorn of her pretensions she succeeded in obtaining admittance to the castle and soon stood in the presence of the hardy captain speaking in a firm tone she told him she came from her lord to succor the king and that she would raise the siege of orleans and bring charles to reims to be crowned the captain struck with her appearance and astonished at her words believed her possessed with the devil and sent immediately for the curé upon entering her presence the frightened priest exhibited his stolen scarf and commanded the evil spirits to depart if they guided her she simply smiled upon him and conversed with so much honesty and unaffected simplicity that the curé himself was bewildered the news that the prophecy concerning a pucelle of the marches of lorraine who was to save the realm was about to be accomplished and that the maid had actually appeared through all vaucouillers in commotion crowds hastened to see her and hear her words and all were equally vehement in their admiration and confident of her saintly commission several of the nobility were won over to her cause and promised to conduct her to the king for she assured them that no one in the world nor kings nor dukes nor daughter of the king of scotland could recover france but herself and that it was her lord's will she should do it urging them to hasten for she must be at orleans before midland baudricourt sent messages to the king to obtain his consent to an interview with joan orleans being closely besieged the inhabitants not able to defend it much longer and charles crown being dependent on the preservation of this last stronghold he was willing to grasp any aid however supernatural if it would but serve his purpose receiving his orders for her advance she set out from vaucouleurs equipped in man's attire mounted upon a fiery black charger the gift of the admiring inhabitants and armed with a sword bestowed by baudricourt at her departure a message of entreaty threats and commands came from her parents who were frantic with the thought of trusting their youngest and delicate daughter to all the horrors and exposures of war but joan still firm in her resolves begged their forgiveness and continued her journey with an escort of three knights the district that lay between vaucouleurs and chinon where charles held his court was overrun with men of arms at both parties making the journey extremely perilous but joan fearlessly traversed it cheering her companions who regretted the undertaking and began to fear that their charge was a witch or sorceress she continued to face danger with the utmost tranquillity and insisted upon sojourning at every little town to hear mass or to repeat her prayers in the churches at fierbois she remained a long time kneeling before the altar in st catherine's cathedral in spite of the entreaties of her impatient escort after escaping an ambuscade that had been laid for her they arrived safely at chinon here in a strong castle the ruins of which still ornamented the town charles and his courtiers were assembled a rich suite of apartments was occupied by his queen mary of anjou and her ladies of honor among whom was agnes sorrel known by the appellation of fairest of the fair and lady of beauty and celebrated as much for her gaiety of temper entertaining conversation and grace of manner as for her beauty the gentle submissive queen had consented to live amicably with this beautiful woman who shared the affection of the king and had a powerful influence over him seeing the hopeless condition of orleans he would have fled to the remote province of dauphigny and abandoned his crown but for the spirited agnes and the prudent sensible queen both of whom warned him that his followers would forsake him if he betrayed his despair by, of success by flight End of section 12 Recording by Aubrey Kirkham Thirteen of the Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amanda John Quinn the Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins Section 13, Part 2 The news of the coming of Joan excited hope, fear, and curiosity in the occupants of the castle. Uncertain whether to receive her, and fearing lest he should place himself in the power of an evil spirit, Charles called a council of warriors, priests, and bishops to consider the dangers or advantages of accepting one who might be a sorceress for their leader.
As for trusting the events of war to a woman, such an objection was not raised, since it was a common occurrence for the fair sex to engage in battle, and in those very years the Bohemian women fought like men in the wars of the Hussites. The council, however, debated for two days the expediency of even admitting her to the king's presence, but it was finally decided that, if she could prove the divinity of her mission, by selecting the king from among his courtiers, she should receive the equipment she desired and accompany such forces as could be raised to Orléans. In the meantime, Joan was conducted to the queen's apartments, where the two friendly rivals received her with equal interest and curiosity. The rustic peasant girl exhibited no wonder as she entered the luxurious abode of the queen, where, in the soft shade of purple hangings, richly worked with golden fleur-de-lis, sat the attendants, industriously engaged with their embroidery frames, while the queen, with fur-bordered robes, occupied a slightly raised platform covered with tapestry. Her face was expressive and gentle, with a shade of subdued sadness resting upon it, and in her eyes beamed a soft winning radiance that reassured the timid girl, who modestly approached, though not overawed by the royal presence. She answered the questions relating to her childhood and the voices with the same simplicity and sweetness as when among her companions. The beautiful Agnes, whose vanity always found her a position and light that best displayed her faultless form, and a complexion clear as the coloring of Correggio, half reclined in a rich costume, her sandaled foot resting upon a velvet cushion. With a keen, penetrating gaze, she bent her full dark eye upon Joan, so cross-questioning her as might easily have bewildered an intentional deceiver. The result of this interview was the unreserved approval of the two who most influenced the king, thus preparing him to place greater confidence in Joan's account when she appeared before him. When the hour for presentation arrived, Joan was conducted to a magnificent hall arched and ornamented with dark fretwork, upon which was thrown the brilliant and waving light of fifty torches. A crowd of nobles and more than three hundred knights in emblazoned court dresses added to the splendor of the scene. The king, in no way distinguished by his attire, mingled with the courtiers. To the surprise of the assemblage, upon Joan's entrance they beheld, instead of a woman of masculine form and courageous front, only a slender, delicate girl, a poor little shepherdess, who with a face pale and chaste as the icicle that's curdled by the frost of purest snow and hangs on Diane's temple. Advanced with composed air, and with as modest a countenance as if she had been bred up in court all her life, being led to a knight of distinguished bearing, she said he was not the king, and immediately selected the true Charles from among the brilliant throng, fell at his feet, and, embracing his knees, exclaimed, Gentle Dauphin! The King of Heaven sends you word by me that you shall be consecrated and crowned in the city of Rheims. The king raised her, and, still unconvinced, led her aside. When she told him of a circumstance he had supposed known to himself alone, namely, that he had prayed in his oratory that God would restore his kingdom or allow him to escape safely to Spain or Scotland, Charles paled at this revelation of his secret prayer, and no longer doubted that the maid was the appointed rescuer of his crown. It did not occur to him, nor to those present, that she had been in the Queen's apartments and might have heard of it there, as well as have seen or listened to some outline of his personal appearance which enabled her to distinguish him. She was certainly a girl of good sense, and shrewdness, but in her honesty and simplicity might have been but vaguely conscious of what occurred in the royal apartments, and mingled her impressions with the revelations of the voices. Still there were many who were not willing to rely upon the mysterious pretensions of the maid, and it was resolved to refer the matter to the doctors of theology. They were equally puzzled for a decision, either because of their superstition, or because they were careful not to take sides in a matter which divided the court, shirking their responsibility, by referring an examination to the University of Poitiers. By a proclamation from the Archbishop of Rheims, also President of the Royal Council, which held its sittings in Poitiers. A great number of doctors and professors of theology, including priests and monks, besides members of Parliament, assembled at the capital of the department to determine the case of this little peasant girl. Joan, always attired in the dress of a man, was conducted to Poitiers, 
but without trepidation or concern for the result of the trial, looked with admiring eyes upon the varied scenery while journeying, sure to dismount at every little church to repeat an Ave Maria before its altar, whether its spire upheld the cross in the midst of a town through which she passed, or whether humbly nestled in a hermit-like retreat among the hills and valleys that lay between Chinon and the parliamentary city. Poitiers was easily descried in the distance, for it crowned and girdled a hill at the junction of two rivers. A thick wall, flanked by strong towers, guarded the city, which boasted the remains of an old Roman castle and amphitheatre, besides its splendid cathedrals and imposing palaces. Joan approached the city, that had so much interest for her, passed through the gates without fear, and guided through the narrow, crooked streets, was conducted to the house of an advocate of the Parliament and left in the care of his wife. The following day, the pompous prelates having assembled, the maid was conducted to the vast hall where they sat. Upon being questioned, she related all that she had seen and heard in a sweet, heart-touching voice, and with a simplicity and innocence that already won the grim judges before whom she meekly stood. After she asserted that she obeyed the directions of God and his angels, a Dominican friar said, Joan, thou sayest that God wishes to deliver the people of France. If such be his will, he has no need of men at arms. To this she readily replied, Ah, the men at arms will fight, and God will give the victory. A professor of theology in the university demanded a sign from her by which they might believe in the holiness of her mission. To this she quickly retorted, I have not come to Poitiers to work signs or miracles. My sign will be the raising of the siege of Orléans. Give me men at arms, few or many, and I will go. With all their cross-questioning, they could find nothing to condemn in her, and therefore countenanced the granting of the forces she asked. The people of Poitiers went in crowds to see her, wept at her winning childish purity, and declared, The maid was of God. Messengers from Dunois, the celebrated bastard of Orléans, who with his forces was in the besieged city, urged hasty measures to be adopted. In reply to his impatient demands, Joan was fully equipped and provided with a suitable escort. She wore a complete suit of white armor, a small axe, and at her side a sword upon which was engraved the royal insignia of three fleurs-de-lis. This sword she had demanded from the learned assembly, telling them that they would find it behind the altar of St. Catherine's Cathedral at Fierbois. This information proving correct, the odd monks bore the miraculous sword to the girl, whom they seriously began to fear, forgetting that she had prayed at St. Catherine's altar for hours, when she might have heard the whisperings of priests, or have spied the sword herself, yet undoubtedly she believed it had been placed there by her favorite saint. She bore a white standard in her hand, embroidered with fleur-de-lis, and upon which was represented a shield and sword surmounted by a crown, and a beautifully painted image of the Saviour. Thus equipped and mounted upon her black charger, accompanied by one of her own brothers, a page, a maître d'hôtel, an old knight, his valets, and a confessor of the order of St. Augustine, she set out for Bois, where a large body of troops were rallying to follow her charmed standard. The impatient army waited on the banks of the Loire, with a large convoy of provisions for the relief of the beleaguered city. Joan was received by them with enthusiastic shouts, young, beautiful, modest, and courageous, with the attributes of a saint. The soldiers looked upon her with mingled admiration, worship, and fear. She found herself surrounded by the cavaliers of Italy and Aragon, the valiant Scots, the Gascon nobles, the fierce fire-eaters of the gallant Count Dunois, and the cruel but brave Armagnacs, a band of ferocious brigands with captains at their head who had long been the terror of France. One of them, Gilles de Retz, was not only the robber hero of his own times, but as the original of Bluebeard has been immortalized as the bugbear of nursery tales through every succeeding generation. With such a promiscuous and fearful host, the brave girl unfurled her sainted banner and turned her face toward Orléans. It was springtime, the hills were blossoming with the yellow firts, the meadows were carpeted with velvety green, the vast forests had put off their somber dress and sported fresh fragrant leaves. The deep arches of the wilderness halls echoed the notes of the nightingale, the bluebird winged from grove to perfumed vineyards, while the oriole, drifting like a flake of fire, whirled to the loftiest treetops and joined its sweet notes in the universal concert. 
the air clear and invigorating in its freshness inspired the army with buoyant hopes and a good will that made them readily obedient to the commands of their gentle leader she banished from the camp all profligacy endeavoring to elevate the debased character of her followers during the first day's journey she caused an altar to be erected on the banks of the loire in the open air she also partook of the communion and required the same of the soldiers hearing one of the robber captains la Hire, swearing violently she mildly rebuked him fierce as he was he received it with humility promising in future to swear only by his baton joan's purity gentleness and religious zeal gained her a strong power over those armagnac brigands who would have devotedly followed her wherever she chose to lead even on a crusade to the holy sepulchre the remainder of the army were scarcely less infatuated their enthusiasm increased daily as they saw her sharing their hardships sleeping unpillowed upon the damp earth encased in her protecting armor they marched rapidly along the southern banks of the loire where the heights were covered with orchards vineyards castles and villages passing chambord and the clustered turrets and towers of an imposing castle that marked its boundaries in the midst of a neighboring wood they approached within a few leagues of orleans joan was impatient to cross the river and enter the city on the northern side where the english encampment lay this the chiefs would not hear to and their counsel was supported by the count dunois who came from orleans with an escort to meet them and induced Joan to adopt a less perilous entrance by water. Orleans stood at the extremity of an elevated plain which terminates near the banks of the Loire. The broad, rapid river washing its southern walls prevented the English from investing it completely. In the beginning of the siege, the French had burned the entire suburbs, which were extensive as a city and contained a countless number of churches, convents, and monasteries that would have served as so many strongholds for the English, besides many finely built houses, the resorts of the burghers of Orléans. The inhabitants had retired within the embattled walls that encircled the city, flanked by square towers at short intervals, and thickly planted with cannon which, by the destruction of the suburbs, could play freely among advancing ranks of the besiegers. The English were protected by fifty or more bastilles and forts, erected and strongly garrisoned by men-at-arms, whose commanders were selected from the flower of the English army. The commander-in-chief, Salisbury, and the distinguished Talbot, occupied the nearest bastille, while the one next to the Loire was entrusted to Sir William Gladsdale, as being a post of danger. Moving towers and battering engines added to the formidable and firm appearance of their position. The English soldiers were nearly as superstitious as their foes, and their army was partly composed of French troops of the Burgundian party. They were filled with dread and fear at the thought of fighting against a maid, commissioned by heaven, or as some thought, a sorceress or a saint who had the power of striking them to the earth by a word. Her fame had arrived before her, but her entrance into Orléans escaped the vigilance of the English since it was covered by the darkness of a midnight tempest as is asserted by some others record her arrival at quote, eight o'clock of the evening april twenty ninth when so great and so eager was the crowd striving to touch her horse at least that her progress through the streets was exceedingly slow they gazed at her as if they were beholding an angel she rode along speaking kindly to the people and after offering up prayers in the church repaired to the house of the duke of orleans treasurer an honorable man whose wife and daughter gladly welcomed her End quote. The succeeding day she rode gaily around the walls of the city to reconnoitre the English Bastilles, followed by a crowd who afterward repaired with her to the church of St. Croix to attend Vespers, and with French readiness to laugh or shed tears, so occasion may direct, feasted and smiled upon each other at the prospect of a near deliverance from their enemies. The armor were raised above all fear, drunk with religion and war and furious with a fanaticism equal to their previous despair. The first attack which she led was directed against one of the northern Bastilles, strongly defended by men-at-arms. Talbot came to their assistance with a formidable detachment, but a fresh outpouring from the gates of Orléans and the approach of the maid in her white armor and emblazoned surcoat so filled them with fear that wherever her magic standard appeared, the soldiers threw down their arms and fled in consternation. 
the Bastille was taken, razed to the ground, and its defenders either put to the sword or carried prisoners into Orléans. Joan, at this first scene of carnage, wept to see so many perish unconfessed, and commanded the following day to be observed by fasting, prayer, and confession. The next morning she addressed her troops, and assured the commanders that victory was certain, they sallied out in the early sun, the knights with glittering helmets and polished shields, and coats of mail over which were thrown elegantly embroidered surcoats of silk or satin, whereon were curiously beaten the arms of their house in gold, the men-at-arms bristling with murderous weapons, the scalers and the archers, filed out of the city and throwing themselves in boats crossed the Loire, and attacked the Tournelle, erected on the opposite bank and defended by Glasdale. Joan, in the beginning of the onset, was wounded by an arrow and fell, but was rescued, borne away from the scene of conflict, and laid upon the grass. Upon unloosing her armor and examining the wound, she found the arrow had pierced her through, and terrified, wept with womanly weakness. This was but for a moment, for her voices came again. She rallied her strength and courage, dressed the wound with oil, and remained till nightfall in communion with her protecting saints who appeared to her excited vision surrounded by a halo of light. Her standard was borne by a Basque soldier in the thickest of the affray, and never failed to disperse the enemy. While victory was still wavering between the two parties, the citizens of Orléans became impatient to decide the contest, rushed forth in a body, and assailed the French forces, who were urged on by shouts from the maid, exclaiming, "'Enter, all is yours!' At a bound they gained the redoubt, and the English, terrified at the rush, and believing they saw the patron saint of the city or the archangel Michael protecting the French, fled in dismay to a bastille connected with the redoubt by a small bridge. A cannon-ball shivered the bridge while they were crowded upon it, precipitating them into the river, and placing them at the mercy of their foes. Glasdale, who had heaped epithets of shame upon the head of the maid, was drowned before her eyes. Ah, how I pity thy soul, she exclaimed, as she saw him borne down in useless struggles by the weight of his armor, to rise no more. These and other decisive defeats completely disheartened the English commanders, who saw their own troops paralyzed in the presence of the reputed sorceress, fall down in terror before her standard, and at the same time beheld the Orleanist possessed of a ferocious courage and fanatical confidence of success that made them irresistible. Unwilling to risk another battle, Talbot and Suffolk ordered a retreat, leaving on the plain their artillery, the Bastilles, the sick, wounded, and such prisoners as they had taken. While they were marching away, Joan had an altar erected on the plain, and mass sung in the hearing of the retreating enemy, tingling their ears with a sound of triumph and thanksgiving as they went out of sight. There was no longer a doubt entertained of the divine mission of the peasant girl, henceforth called the Maid of Orléans, and admitted to the councils of war. Messengers were now sent to Charles the Seventh, still indolently whiling away his time in the castle at Chinon, to come speedily with whatever forces he could collect, and follow up their success before the English should be strengthened by detachments sent by the Duke of Bedford at Paris, under the command of Sir John Falstaff. As soon as the king arrived, the French were eager to see the accomplishment of the remainder of Joan's promises, and hastened to take possession of Sargeau and Beaugency before these places could be relieved by the English. The armies of Talbot and Sir John Falstaff had meanwhile effected a junction, and being in a section overgrown with thickets and brambles, the Orleanists in pursuit of them could not discover their position. Joan now rode at the head of a rapidly increasing army. Recruits poured in from all quarters, wrought to the highest pitch of enthusiasm at the reported miracles Joan had performed, and elated at the late successes. The English are uniting, said she, but in God's name advance boldly against them, and assuredly they shall be conquered. But where shall we find them? asked some. Ride boldly forward, and you will be conducted to them, she replied. A band of sixty horsemen were sent in advance to reconnoiter, Unable to discover the English, they started a stag which rushed into the enemy's ranks. A loud shout of surprise from them betrayed their position, while the French men-at-arms galloped up to the disordered army, gave them no time to rally, and rushed upon them. The soldiers, from fear of the maid, had been deserting in great numbers, 
and now as she rode fearlessly at the head of a force multiplied into a host in the bewildered vision of the enemy the english leaders could do nothing with the dismayed troops sir john falstaff though he had won honors for his courageous conduct in other battles seemed overwhelmed with fear and confusion and catching the superstitious spirit that infatuated his troops turned and fled from the battlefield without striking a blow for which cowardice the enraged duke of bedford deprived him of the order of the garter talbot was unwilling again to show his back to the royalists he fought bravely but was deserted by his followers and taken prisoner while the rest were pursued and put to the sword at the sight of the awful carnage the maiden later wept she obeyed the impulse of her tender sympathy she dismounted and held the head of one who had been cut down before her praying for his soul while she attempted to soothe his dying agonies after the signal victory of this battle of pate the french eager to see the king crowned at rheims went triumphantly from town to town carrying everything before them Quote, the indolent young monarch himself was hurried away by this popular tide which swelled and rolled northward king courtiers politicians enthusiasts fools and wise were off together either voluntarily or compulsorily at starting they were twelve thousand but the mass gathered bulk as it rolled along end quote. upon approaching troyes it was found so well garrisoned that the army large as it was despaired of forcing it without artillery a council was assembled after taking their position under the walls in which the leaders unanimously advised the abandonment of their march to Rheims, since it would be poor policy to leave such a stronghold in their rear, and impossible to besiege the city since they lacked both provision and artillery. One Armagnac captain disputed the retreat. While they were warmly debating, Joan herself knocked at the door, and assured them they should be in Troyes in three days. "'We would willingly wait six, said the Chancellor. "'Were we certain you spoke sooth?' Six, you shall enter to-morrow exclaimed the heroic girl seizing her standard and calling upon the troops to follow her end of section thirteen scene of the heroines of history this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by matthew reese the Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins Joan of Arc, Part 3 A portion of the ditch or fosse that surrounded the city was quickly filled in by her direction, and, while they prepared to cross and make the attack, the English offered to capitulate, reserving the privilege of marching away with their effects without molestation. As they passed from the gates, Joan perceived a number of French prisoners manacled and driven before them. She refused to let them pass, and the king was obliged to ransom them. The way was now open for their progress to Reims. Upon approaching that city, a deputation of the citizens went out to meet the king, presenting him the keys of the city and acknowledging him their sovereign. Joan led the way with her white banner always unfurled and floating like a beckoning spirit before the impetuous and worshipping army who followed wherever it conducted them. Her face beamed the triumph and joy she felt. Passing through the massive gateway, they went with a conqueror's step along the thronged streets, and then to the cathedral to offer prayers and thanksgiving. This cathedral stood in a square, from which the six principal streets of Reims diverged. It was here that, two days after, the promised coronation took place. The holy oil of Clovis, secretly kept in the old church of St. Remy's, was brought with great ceremony by priests who were met at the entrance of the cathedral by the archbishop. He received it, and, approaching the king, who bowed reverently before it, consecrated him with all the state and pomp that the mysterious aid by which the event had been attained could suggest. The dark, massive walls, from which graceful arches sprang and fell, resting upon tall clustered columns, the curious and elaborate carvings everywhere visible, the vast interior crowded with ferocious soldiers, bearing their battle-axes and crossbows, knights with plumed helmets and gold-embroidered surcoats, the glittering mail of the men-at-arms, the fair and noble ladies of Reims in their enormous and lofty headdresses, the nobles in rich coronation robes, grouped about their monarch, who stood prominent in the stateliest array of royalty.
the pompous archbishop, and above all, the maid with helmed head, like a war goddess, fair and terrible, standing near the king, her sacred sword sheathed, and her banner dropping in folds upon her white armor, together formed a scene that filled the superstitious throng with a feeling of awe and wonder, and hushed them all to silence. When the crown, a golden bauble to gain which such rivers of blood had flowed, was placed upon the monarch's head, Joan burst into tears and prostrated herself at his feet, beseeching him, now that her promises were fulfilled, to permit her to return to her own valley, and with her sisters watch the flocks upon the hills, and be happy and peaceful again with her grieved parents. All who listened wept with her, but Charles, unwilling to lose one upon whom his battles depended, would not consent to her departure till the English were driven from France. As a mark of his gratitude, he ennobled her family, giving them the title of Dulice, in allusion to the lilies on her banner, and presented her with a handsome estate. The movements of the army were now like so many triumphal processions. City after city surrendered without resistance, till it arrived at St. Denis. Joan refused to proceed further, warned by her voices, or presentiments, that she could not advance with safety. Regardless of her advice, the commanders, elated with past success, pushed forward to Paris. The Duke of Bedford was alarmed at the rapid progress of the Orleanists. He sent to the Duke of Burgundy for assistance, and afterwards to the powerful Cardinal Winchester, who hastily raised forces in England, and came to Paris with the young Henry VI in order to crown him there. Thus strengthened, and in possession of the Seine both above and below the city, it was impossible for Charles the Seventh to besiege it with his army, ill provided with the necessary provisions and equipments. In the very face of impossibilities he advanced towards the strong and well-prepared city, depending on the mysterious power of the maid and the enthusiasm of his followers. They carried one of the outposts, and the brave and fearless Joan cleared the first fosse with a bound, firmly maintaining her seat, and in another spring was beyond the mound that separated it from the second where but few dared to follow her. Her conspicuous dress was a fair mark for the showers of arrows falling thickly around her. Regardless of her danger, she sounded the depth of the fosse with her lance, but, while urging the troops to follow, an arrow darted through the links of her armor and pierced deeply, causing such a flow of blood as obliged her to seek shelter. The French were repulsed with severe losses. The headlong impetuosity that had served them before would not calmly brook reserves and they were ready to heap reproaches and harsh epithets upon the brave girl who had warned them not to make the rash attempt upon Paris. Disheartened and weak with pain and loss of blood, she could not be prevailed upon to return to the camp till after nightfall. The French now abandoned the hope of securing Paris, and occupied the winter in laying siege to two towns, one of which was successfully carried by the exertions of Joan, the other abandoned in a panic. In the meantime, the Duke of Burgundy assembled a formidable army, and with the English troops in the spring of 1430 laid siege to Compiègne, where the French were concentrated. The maid threw herself into the city, and on the second day headed a sally against the besiegers. In the beginning of the struggle her party was successful, but the English rallied and drove back the assailants. Joan remained in the rear, to cover the retreat of her followers, reached the bridge too late to enter the gates which suddenly closed, and, Betrayed by the governor of the city, she was left among the crowd upon the bridge. Conspicuous by her dress, a purple surcoat brilliantly embroidered with gold, thrown over her armor, she was immediately seized by a Picard archer, and dragged from her horse. She surrendered to the bastard of Vendôme, a distinguished knight, who conducted her to the English camp and placed her under a secure guard. The soldiers crowded about and gazed upon her and the English nobles and Burgundians could not restrain their exclamations of surprise at finding the witch, the sorceress, the great object of terror, to be only a simple, delicate, and fair young girl. They were more delighted at her capture than if they had taken a host of French prisoners, and assembling in showy array in the plain before Compiègne, sent up shouts of victory. Joan was sold to John of Luxembourg, who sent her under a strong guard to the castle in Beaulieu, in Picardy, where she was confined in the highest tower. But soon after, from political motives, he had her removed to his own castle of Beaurevoir. 
Here she could only gaze from the narrow windows of the loftiest tower upon the meadows, the streams, and the blue hills, beyond which she could fancy see her peaceful home, her mourning parents, and her young and loved Homette, with whom she would have given worlds to breathe the free air again. A close prisoner, and in despair for France, fearful too for her own fate, she passed the weary days in prayer and weeping. She was filled with forebodings of evil. She had endeavored to effect her escape from the castle of Beaulieu, and even now from the high towers of Beaurevoir the intrepid girl attempted a descent. She fell, and was taken up half dead by the ladies of Luxembourg, who bestowed the most tender care upon her. They were won by her gentleness, and doubly attracted by sympathy for her grief that she could no longer aid France, and her tears and anxiety for the king for whom she suffered, but who made no effort for her deliverance. She knew that her present captor had sold her to the Duke of Burgundy, and suffered herself to be led away from her new-found friends, who in vain pled with tears at the feet of John of Luxembourg, entreating him not to deliver her into the hands of the English, thirsting as they did, for the blood of one who had cost them so dearly. She was conveyed to Arras, and from thence to the dungeon-keep of Crotoy, where she could look out upon the sea and watch the ships gliding to and fro, or driving along on the waves of a tempest. A clear day revealed the distant coast of England. It reminded her of the Duke of Orléans, who, like herself, a close prisoner, wore his life away in chains on a foreign shore. All her fire and spirit was roused, for it had been one of her treasured hopes to secure his release, when the French arms had triumphed. Joan was consoled and strengthened by a priest who, likewise a captive, said mass daily in her presence. In this she heartily joined, her old enthusiasm returning and her courage revived by the voices which assured her that she should be delivered when she had seen the king of the English. Nearly a year had passed since her first imprisonment, when she was claimed by the bishop of the diocese in which she was taken, at the instigation of Cardinal Winchester, whose plan was to crown Henry the Sixth and, at the same time, disgrace the pretensions of Charles the Seventh by burning the girl who had secured his coronation as a witch or sorceress. By order of the vicar of the Inquisition, Joan was taken to Rouen in February 1431. Released from her long confinement, she exulted in the pure, fresh air of freedom, and rode cheerfully along with her keepers, though still manacled with chains. Approaching Rouen, the inhabitants thronged the entrance to catch a glimpse of the wonderful being who was represented, at one moment, a beautiful woman, an angel, and at the next, described as a demon who possessed a terrible power over her enemies. They hardly knew whether to shrink from her gaze, or touch and kiss her garments. All were filled with amazement at beholding so fair and harmless a girl. The women of Rouen, in their tall muslin caps, red petticoats and clattering cabots, followed her through the streets and with motherly protection would have shielded her from the denunciations about to descend upon her, could they have rescued her from the grim monks who closely guarded her. Joan felt her spirit depressed as they traced the narrow winding streets of Rouen, lined with peak-roofed houses, decorated with curious carvings and innumerable balconies. Towers and spires with rich-cut ornaments loomed up along the narrow way which was crowded and confused with passing donkeys, laden with well-filled panniers and driven by quaintly dressed women and children, while men in silken jackets and long-peaked shoes added their sonorous cries to the babble of voices. Joan, weary and bewildered, was soon led before the impatient assemblage, eager for their victim. Bishops, monks, doctors of theology and of the canon law, enveloped in stately robes, sat ready to pronounce judgment upon a girl whom they were bribed to condemn by some means, if she were guilty or not. Alone in the midst of this subtle court, without the sympathy of a friend or the aid of a counsel, Joan sat with intrepid bearing, her spirit free, though her limbs were chained. Upon being required to swear to speak the truth, she consented, but refused to reveal anything connected with her visions. She was ordered to repeat the Pater and the Ave, her judges thinking that she would not dare to if possessed with an evil spirit. To their surprise she readily assented if the presiding bishop would hear her confess. This touching and confiding demand overcame the bishop, who adjourned the sitting, and afterwards deputed one of his assessors to question the accused. 
As it was found impossible to convict her on the ground of sorcery, she was charged with heresy, since she refused to acknowledge the authority of the church militant. She told them she held her belief in God alone. The long-continued trial, and her efforts to sustain herself, induced an illness, from which she had not recovered when she was again summoned to the hall of the castle where the court sat. Threats of torture were given to intimidate her, but she adhered firmly to her account of the voices, and would still acknowledge none but the one God. They insisted upon her discarding the man's dress she wore, but to this she would not consent, it being her only protection, and the dress which her saints directed her to wear. Led back to the tower, where every movement was watched by keepers stationed near her, she became more severely ill. In this situation her tormentors visited her, hoping to make her yield her belief while too weak to maintain courage in her assertions. The angel Gabriel, said she, has appeared to strengthen me. They were obliged to leave her, firm and unyielding as she had ever been. In order to terrify her into submission, a scaffold was erected in the cemetery of St. Juan, behind the church of the same name. Joan was placed upon it in the midst of hussiers and torturers, a preacher and an executioner in his cart below her. Opposite, on another scaffolding, sat Cardinal Winchester and the bishops, with their assessors and scribes. The preacher, who was to exhort and urge her to submission, overdid the matter by exclaiming violently against Charles the Seventh calling him a heretic and accepting Joan for a leader. This roused the indignation of the brave girl who, in spite of threatened terrors, had the nobleness to defend the king who had deserted her. On my faith, sir, I undertake to tell you and to swear on pain of my life that he is the noblest Christian of all Christians, the sincerest lover of the faith of the church, and not what you call him, exclaimed she boldly. Silence her, cried out the bishop, who began to read the sentence of condemnation, abjure or be burnt, reached her ears. Those about and below her entreated her to save herself by acknowledging the power of the Pope. We pity you, Joan, urged the people who crowded about the scaffold. Overcome at last with fear and entreaties, she consented to abjure, on condition she should be delivered from the power of the English and be placed in the hands of the Church. What is to be done next? respectfully asked Carichon, the bishop, turning to Cardinal Winchester. Admit her to do penance, answered the wily Englishman, which penance was to pass the rest of her days in imprisonment, on the bread of grief and the water of anguish. Take her back whence you brought her, continued the bishop, while Joan, dumb with surprise and despair, could scarcely move. The poor girl had thought at least she was to be spared chains and the hateful dungeon. Even at this respite the English were so enraged that they pelted the bishop with stones, and the priests and doctors could escape only by promising they should soon have her again. She was led away to her prison house and chained to a beam, but this did not satisfy the English, who attributed the continued success of the French arms to her sorcery, exerted even within the walls of a prison. The guards were ordered to hang her armor within reach, hoping she would be tempted to resume the dress and thus break the conditions she had signed. The result was what they wished, and, as soon as the news reached the cardinal, he gladly exclaimed, She is caught! The inquisitor and others were deputed to visit and question her. She bravely faced them, and told them she had resumed the dress, because it was fitter for her, as long as she was guarded by men. Put me in a seemly prison, and I will be good and do whatever the church shall wish, said she. The next day it was told her she must die. She wept pitifully, tearing her hair and mourning that she was to endure the frightful torture of being burned. After the first burst of grief she confessed, and asked to receive the sacrament, which was granted her, with the inconsistency of condemning her as a heretic, and at the same time granting her all the ordinances of the church. The following morning she was dressed in female attire, placed on a cart, accompanied by priests, and surrounded by a guard of eight hundred Englishmen, armed with sword and lance, who conveyed her to the old marketplace. She wept as they went along, crying out, O oh, Rouen, Rouen, must I then die here? Three scaffolds were erected, one upon which a throne was placed for the Cardinal Winchester and the prelates, and the third, 
built high and filled underneath with faggots, was for the harmless victim. The ceremony began with a sermon, preached by one of the doctors of the University of Paris. This was followed by exhortations from the bishops to recant all she had said concerning her angels. But, though she was bitterly disappointed that none had come to rescue her, and her confidence in the voices thus sorely tried, because they failed to deliver her, still she affirmed the truth of her assertions, and persisted in rejecting the Pope and his minions. Though you should tear off my limbs and pluck my soul from my body, I would say nothing else, she cried. She knelt upon the platform, invoked God, the Virgin, St. Michael, and St. Catherine, then turned to those who had accused her, forgave them their injuries, and besought their pardon, asking them to pray for her. She entreated the priests each to say a mass for her soul. Her manner, voice, and look were so full of grief, and her appeals so touching that, with contagious sympathy, every beholder wept even the cruel cardinal. Vexed at betraying such weakness, the judges dried their eyes and, crushing the momentary feeling of kindness for the lovely and friendless girl, proceeded to read her condemnation in a stern voice. The faggots were kindled, and as they crackled and burned beneath the platform, she cried out for a crucifix. An Englishman gave her one he had hastily carved out of a stick, but she entreated them to bring one from the neighboring church which, after some hesitation, was obtained and held up before her. At last, overcome with terror and suffocated with the smoke and flames that curled about her delicate form, she expired with prayers on her lips. The multitude wept at her sufferings and silently dispersed, full of consternation at the deed. Even the executioner hastened to relieve his terror and remorse by confession. Thus perished a fair and innocent girl, who had committed no crime but that of seeking to rescue her nation from the grasp of a hated enemy. Pure, gentle, and heroic, imbued with the superstition of the times, gifted with a vivid, intense imagination that had become morbid through her early habits of lonely communion, it was not wonderful that she should imagine she conversed with spirits in an age when everyone consulted unseen spirits and fairies to some extent. She was educated from the cradle, in the belief of visions of saints and angels, assurances of which fell daily upon her ear in tales and legends from her mother's lips. The French believed and accepted her as a celestial deliverer, investing her with a supernatural power which she did not claim. On one occasion at Bourges, when the women prayed her to touch crosses and chaplets, she laughed merrily and said, Touch them yourselves, they will be just as good. Her success was simply that of a warrior who inspires his troops with his own courage and confidence of victory, and rushes to battle with an impetuosity that sometimes supplies a lack of skill. She took advantage of the superstition of those she led, as well as those she opposed. She embodied their ideal of an angel in mortal form, by the purity of her beauty, manner, and words, which was manifested even in her equipments and thus they followed her with a unity and enthusiasm that gave strength to a party that previously owed its weakness to an indolent and despairing prince, and to the divisions and feuds among the leading nobility. Through all the deference and honors paid her, she never lost the childlike sweetness and simplicity that were singularly united in her character with good sense, shrewdness, and woman's subtlety. Charles the Seventh who owed his crown and kingdom to her heroic exertions, acknowledged the debt by causing a monument to be erected to her memory in Paris, so soon as his power was established. The inhabitants of Rouen testified their admiration of her and their disapprobation of the unjust sentence by erecting a statue that still stands in the marketplace of the old city. The house in which she was born was afterwards repaired on the original plan by the king's orders, and still remains in Dom Remy. It stands near the church and is easily discovered by a gothic door that supports three scutcheons adorned with the fleur-de-lis, and a statue in which she is represented in full armor. It became national property during the reign of Louis the Eighteenth, who granted the village 12,000 francs to build a monument to the memory of Joan, 8,000 for the education of young girls in Dom Remy and the neighboring hamlets, and another 8,000 as a support for a sister of charity to teach the school. A fine painting, the gift of the king, 
decorates the principal room of the house. In the marketplace, which is surrounded by poplar trees and watered by a fountain, is placed a statue of the maid. On the monument is the simple inscription, To the Memory of Joan of Arc. End of section 14. Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa.